future generations. Rawls and many others have addressed justice between generations. Again, this was also not uh, or, or, uh, mentioned in the, by the previous speaker. It's an ancient concept and many cultures and traditions hold that we, those on living in the present, have a moral obligation and duty to humans yet unborn to leave the earth in as good a condition as we find it. But this is where the potential discovery of extraterrestrial biological entities may provide a very unique situation that Rawls and others didn't anticipate. As I suggested previously, could Rawls' original position include not only humans of future generations, but non-humans as well? And might our obligations to future human generations be expanded to include future generations of other species and the extraterrestrial biological entities I've described? What constitutes future human generations is changing and changing rapidly. Our descendants, perhaps within a few generations, will no longer necessarily be limited to a, tradition, to a traditionally defined homo sapiens. Rather, our species is becoming less distinct and singular as techniques allowing artificial sharing of genomes among species, xenotransplantation, or using non-human biological materials in humans, such as pig valves and malfunctioning hearts, mechanical and cybernetic augmentation, as these shatter the singular definition of human. If we were to encounter these entities five or ten generations from now, we may not recognize them as human, and it may not matter that they aren't. Added to this, next, as we encounter extraterrestrial biological entities, how might these theories be adapted to provide guidance in our obligations that include a diversity of humans Rawls did not likely imagine, extraterrestrial species or even systems such as landscapes. The ongoing search for extraterrestrial life on Mars or elsewhere in the solar system provides an ideal opportunity to explore the issues of ethical obligations in a fresh and relatively uncontroversial manner. And using the product of such discussions, we can better reconsider definitions of what it means to be human and our concepts of participation as part of universal life itself. But we must ask these questions and work towards their resolution prior to discovery of any life anywhere else. Should we leave the question unanswered, Earth's conflicting and often indefensible ethical standards may become universal. And now the two words everyone is waiting for. In conclusion, <laughs> much of the discussion during this conference focuses on concepts of our various possible futures in space exploration and exploitation our shared visions of what those alternatives may require and their potential to further human goals. We are imagining fantastic physical structures and architectures, engineering projects on other planets that dwarf anything ever attempted on Earth, innovation and amazing new knowledge in physics, chemistry, and engineering. Yet in these bold new extraterrestrial environments, we tend to visualize ourselves as a species, as Homo sapiens, largely unchanged, next, in our ways of thinking and our ways of acting. If we initiate exploration, next, colonization and exploitation of other worlds without also rethinking our relationship with those worlds and all that they offer, biological as well as physical, we will have missed a great opportunity for philosophical advancement as well as technological advancement and a chance to redefine what it means to be human. In the closing scene of Arthur C. Clarke's 2010, next, all the, uh, the message sent to humanity by an extraterrestrial intelligence is an invitation, next. All these worlds are yours except Europa. Use them together, use them in peace. I would hope the author meant us to consider the term together was broader than just a reference to peoples of the earth and included all life, all extraterrestrial biological entities. That we use them in peace is an enlightening and novel concept with that inclusion. I stress that the purpose of this proposal is not to argue or campaign for or against equal rights among all living entities, including microbes, or to extend rights to the rocks they might live on. Rather, it is to propose that the very plausible discovery of extraterrestrial biological entities within the next few decades provides the opportunity and perhaps even an obligation to reconsider human relationships with the biological universe we share. Next. 
So that, I am uh, one minute of four by my watch. So, but I would like to take questions. Yes? Yeah. It's difficult to apply roles to non-rational beings because the whole idea is how you feel if you end up in that situation, or how you feel if you end up being a bacterium. I mean, that mm -hmm. question doesn't make much sense. See, um, although I, I think... Well, it, it breaks the paradigm of thinking of humans as somehow separate from the natural world. Um, I don't... I don't think so. You could do roles with the natural world, but you still have to be thinking of beings that are rational beings. Not you, you cannot do it with bacteria. You cannot do it with snakes and so on. Because you're saying they are not rational. Yes, that's right. Um, so I mean, at least beings that would have feelings about the situation, they have some idea of what it would be like. The second problem that you would have in trying to apply to extraterrestrials that do we know anything about is that when you use roles as a system, you imagine all the possible roles that people could play, uh, and then you say, how would you like this role to be defined, or how would you like that role to be defined? But you're talking about possible roles, and, and of course, this changes as time goes on and human experience encounters new different uh, mm -hmm. situations. But since we know absolutely anything about what the extraterrestrials may be like, then we have no idea what those roles are. So if using this system, if we ever find intelligent or even semi-intelligent beings that is using roles, may be the appropriate way to do it. By doing it beforehand, without knowing what they might be like, what kinds of roles we have to, to, to take into consideration, I don't really think you, you can use roles mm -hmm. that way. Okay. Yes? No matter how much we try to put ourselves in the shoes of the Martian microbe, the fact of the matter is that we are still biased. That both sides would agree, well, until you have the other side being able to speak for themselves, you're really not going to be able to do that. We can do something that we think would be equitable to both sides. But, you know. Yes. Well, I, I would put the question this way. Suppose a race of superior aliens discovered us. How would we like them to treat us? If we can answer mm -hmm. that question, maybe we can invite this one. We'd um, like them to go back home. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. There is a certain mm -hmm. line, actually, of moral imperative that it has nothing to do with the aliens themselves, but with us. If we were to discover other life, the kind of knowledge that we'll gain about life in general and about our type of life would be so immense that it would be an, uh, really an affront, an assault on ourselves not to take advantage of it, not to respect it to the point that we really figure out what it is that they are about. So we, that would shed light on what we are by having the ability to compare ourselves to others. You see, so the moral imperative will come that we have towards extraterrestrials is not from from them because we don't imagine what it is like. At least not until they, until we get to know them, but from our own point of view. Even if they are microbes, even fossils will be so important for us just to be able to understand our own type of life better. Right. Yeah. Immense. But, value but that. does everything have to be about us? Okay. I think the thing what, what you're asking us to do is to think beyond ourselves. If I'm hearing. Well, it's a. And, and I think we're, we what we're approaching is an opportunity right. for reconsideration that sort of allows us to break with our with our cultural past of uh, providing ethical standards based on value to humans. Right. So it's so, just a, so, it's a so thought experiment so, to expand that thought. So whereas we can could put ourselves in the place of a Martian microbe, we could imagine what a Martian microbe might become eventually. Now our conclusion maybe is a dying world. Mm -hmm. The life of seen as better days on Mars and it will never become anything. So that might lead us to, to one conclusion. Right. Yes. I, I think that in your, your idea of the guardian ad litem you know, given given the fact that that you know that the whales aren't having conferences about what's <laughs> going on, but the idea of the guardian ad litem, I think, is and, and in one respect that the role of the science fiction writer, in a <clears> sense, <throat> is to be that guardian ad litem. You think of uh, uh, Highland Stranger in a Strange World, where he's trying to be very sensitive 
And you know, he has this term of grokking, which gets us mm -hmm. to this whole qu question of how in the world would you communicate? Well, you can't. But so as as this you know person that lets you just kind of say, well, let's just for a moment, you know, the grass, you know, he grokks the grass that it's okay to walk on it. You know, it's okay. It's all right. I'm 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 good with being walked on. Thank you. Just don't cut me too short or whatever. Um, or in Ender's game, where uh, Ender, uh, you know, it winds up, you know, thinking he's protecting the world against this race of of, of absolutely heartless, uh, you know, heartless evil beasts, insect-like whatevers, you know, and in the end. He winds up being speaker for the dead because he realizes that they view us as you had. Right. They view us, and and I and I'm terrible with names. I'm pointing up names. You know, he's paralyzed. He's, he's a brilliant physicist. Just Hawkins. Like, uh, Hawkins, Hawkins. Thank you. You know, I mean, Hawkins just recently said, "I don't think you'd want a superior race to show up here." You know, which is an interesting thing because it raises the point you raised, and that is, what if the tables are turned here? And they view us as the inferior species. Right. So, uh, Dr. Zubrin is here. Okay. He's the four o'clock speaker.